All right, so hi everyone. Um, as you said, my name is Pascal, and um, so I've spent the last few months uh, reading the Angular 2 source code, and today I would like to share some, some learnings uh, with you, um, and uh, especially about dependency injection for future generations. So I took the topic dependency injection because, um, because of uh, a couple of reasons. I think that dependency injection is important, or at least it's a nice pattern to, to write better code. And uh, in addition to that, I think that the Angular team has done a very, very good job on the new dependency injection system. Um, before I start, a couple of things. So first, I want to thank two persons. Um, Merrick Christensen from Salt Lake City, he gave a great talk on dependency injection at NG Vegas uh, just a few weeks ago. And he basically allowed me to steal some ideas for my talk. And then there's also Wojta Gina, who's a former uh, core member of the Angular team, and he gave a talk about the new dependency injection system last year at ng-conf, which is uh, what everything in this talk is basically based on. He made the original version. Um, what you see today will be like the latest and greatest, and I hope you like it. Um, right, and then there's another thing. Uh, it has nothing to do with the talk at all, but I think it's, it's fun to share. So just recently, um, I, I bought some, some new sunglasses and uh, a soap bubble gun and uh, a selfie stick. And so you might, you might ask uh, yourself, so why is this guy uh, telling us about his latest achievements in online shopping? So the reason for that is that um, it didn't take long for me to realize that you can do some very, very fun stu uh, stuff with it. And, and this is what I, what I did. So basically, it's me running around randomly in the office with my selfie stick and shooting with soap bubbles as, at my colleagues. Um, but yeah, let's, let's talk some business. Uh -huh. <laughs> All right, so dependency injection. Um, so I talked with some people here at the conference, and, and so they came to me and they asked me, yeah, so you're, you're giving a talk here, right? And I was like, yeah, and they were like, okay, so what are you talking about? And I was like, yeah, dependency injection. And they were like, okay, so, so what are you talking about then? So th there's not so much to say about it. And uh, it turned out that, in fact, about dependency injection itself, there's not so super much to, to tell about, but um, again, there, there will be much more, uh, especially in terms of the Angular 2 dependency injection system. So, nonetheless, um, here is my talk basically in a single slide. Uh, dependency injection is a $25 term for a five cent concept. And that's uh, sort of true, actually. Um, so, this guy right here, this is Voita, um, one of the ones that I've mentioned at the beginning of the talk. And um, this is uh, where he gave his talk at ng-conf about dependency injection. And um, so he said that we can see dependency injection basically as first as a de uh, design pattern, and uh, we can also see it as a framework, and we have to distinguish between those two things. And this is um, what I would like to do today as well. I would like to uh, show you the, the pattern itself so that, you, that, you, that we all know what dependency injection actually is. The, the, the five cent concept, and then we talk about the, the dependency injection system or the framework. So, DI as a design pattern, or also known as the five cent concept. Let's start with this class right here. So this is an ES6 class, it's, it's a car, and it has a constructor, and uh, there's some stuff going on, it has a method drive to actually drive, and um, in the constructor we can see that there are basically three dependencies, right? We have, we have an engine, we have tires and we have doors in order to, to create our uh, car. And um, so despite the fact that we now have three different ways to create objects at that uh, particular point, um, it turns out that this is actually not a good thing to do it like that. We have some problems with that code. And the, problems, the problem that we have is that so the car itself knows how to create an engine and the car itself knows how to get tires and doors. And um, this can be a problem if you want to test your code, and as we all know, we, we love testing, and, and we just do it every day. Um, we want to be able to, to write tests for this particular class without uh, too much effort. Like, just, just think about 
uh, switching or swapping out those dependencies with mocks, right? It's pretty hard to do. Um, so what we need is a way to kind of abstract those implementation details away so that the car doesn't know about it, right? Um, and this is what it looks like. So basically what we do is we, we pass in the, the uh, dependencies that we have in the constructor. So now the car needs an engine, it needs tires, and it needs doors in order to, to be created. And this makes the code much more testable, right? Um, because now when we create a car, we are able to um, inject our dependencies from the outside world, and the car itself doesn't know how to create those objects. Um, and this is especially important when we run tests. Um, for each test, we want to create a different environment, right? Like when you write a test spec, um, you have different scenarios that you want to represent in your spec, and therefore you need to be able to um, create objects in, in different um, scenarios and in circum circumstances. So in the end, you can say that testing and reusable code is somewhat like the same thing, right? <clears throat> and uh, this kind of... Uh, construction that we see here is also called constructor injection. And what we can do now is we can create our car like this, right? We pass in our three dependencies, and if we write a test, we can do it like that, and uh, yay, our code is now testable, which is cool. And basically, um, that's it. That's dependency injection. Okay. Um, there's another problem, though, that we have now, which is this guy here. We now have a uh, main method. We now have to kind of wire all of our dependencies together manually ourselves in order to create a car object, right? So here we see all dependencies, and then we get our car. So in this case, it's just a very, very small uh, application, but just, just imagine you have like a lot of classes and, and components and whatever. Um, this can get very, very hairy. Like just think about um, adding just another dependency, right? So you have to really maintain it on each and every single object. So wouldn't it be nice if we, uh, have a, uh, if we had a um, system for that or a kind of service that takes care of wiring everything together when we ask for a specific object? And, and this is basically where um, dependency injection as a framework comes in. So first, we just talked about the design pattern itself, but now we, wanna, we need a solution um, that makes the maintainability um, actually uh, good. So getting back to our main method, what we wanna do, or what would be very nice if, is uh, if we could do something, something like this. So we create an ejector, wherever it comes from. It's just a very abstract kind of code. And we ask the injector to get a car, like an instance of car, and then uh, we can use the car in order to, to work with that. Now, the injector knows how to create a car, and if the car has dependencies, then the injector also takes care of instantiating those dependencies. Otherwise, the car cannot be created. But you see that all the wiring is not there anymore. The injector takes care of that. So, it turns out that um, in Angular 1, for example, we have that kind of system already. So here we have our car class, and in order to tell the injector what other dependencies are needed in order to create such an object, we have to annotate our code. And this is where the dollar inject property of a class comes in, right? This is one way of annotating our code in Angular 1 in order to tell the injector, hey, if you create an object of this class or of this service, um, you also need to create dependencies or other objects from, from those classes. So, and once we've done that, we could do something like this. So what we see here is a, uh, an Angular module that is created, and we register our car as a car service. So basically what happens here is we say, okay, when somebody asks for car, uh, we, that, that um, person gets a, uh, an instance of, of the car service. So, and then we have another service that actually asks for car. And what you see here is another way of um, asking for an object without actually annotating the service itself. 
So here, Angular actually uh, finds out, or, or is smart enough to find out what, what dependency you actually need based on the parameter name, which is car in that, in that case. Which, of course, is a problem when you uh, minify your code. Um, and then in, in that case, you want to use some kind of annotation like, like dollar inject. OK, this is all cool. Um, the, the dependency injection system works very well, but there, we still have some, some problems. So first, we have an internal cache uh, in the injector. So whenever we get an object from a specific service, it's always a singleton. So if you ask for a car service, then you get an instance of car service. And if you ask for a car service at another place, um, you get the, same, the exact same instance back which is something we probably don't want. Maybe we want to um, get a different instance whenever we uh, ask for a specific object. Another problem is that this uh, dependency injection system is synchronous by default, so we're not able to inject um, dependencies that are asynchronously resolved. And we have namespace collisions. There is no things like, there's no thing like a, like a real namespace system. So when you create a service with a name car, and there's a third-party extension, Angular extension, that also introduces the service car, then the last one wins, right? It basically overrides your service. So it's not really able to um, have two different services uh, with the same token in one application. Um, right. And then, last but not least, it's built right into the framework. The DI system of Angular 1 is not a system that we can use in any other code. If you write React or Ember or whatever, there, there's nothing you can do. You either, you either uh, take the, the whole framework or, or nothing. Which brings us to the next animated GIF, taking DI to the next level. Um, is anybody into Dragon Ball? I really like that one. Okay. <clears throat> so DI in, in Angular 2. Um, before we take a look at code of the new DI system, let's first understand the concept of the new DI system. So in Angular 2, um, the dependency injection system has, of course, an injector, right? This is something that we want to have. We want to have a service that we can ask for for object creation. And then, of course, what an injector does is it creates an object. This is what dependency injection in the end is all about, object creation. So, now, the big question is, how do we get there? Like, how does the, the injector know how to instantiate a uh, particular um, object? When we ask for a service, how does, how does the injector know how to create that object? In, in Angular 1, we have things like uh, .service, .factory, .value, .whatever. Um, in Angular 2, in the, the uh, dependency injection system, we get something that is called a binding. So, a binding is basically an instruction that tells the injector um, how to create an object of a certain token, right? So you can see a binding uh, as a sort of recipe, uh, how to create an object. And it takes a token, whatever a token is, we'll get to that in a second, and based on that token, it uh, creates, or the, the injector creates that object, but the, in the binding instruction knows how to create an object of a certain dependency based on a token. OK, so, so what does that actually look like in code? This is what it looks like in code. So what you see here is we are injecting a class injector from the Angular DI source code. And this might change in the future. So um, don't spend too much energy on the first line. It's just somewhere of, some way of getting that particular class. And then we are creating an injector with the method resolve and create. And resolve and create is basically a sort of factory function that lets us create injector instances, like different injector services that we need. And the resolve and create function gets a list of bindings. So you see that, that this list here is basically just a list of the classes that we need as dependencies. So you might wonder, how can classes just be like real bindings? Because they're just classes, right? We, we get into that in a minute. What we want to focus on now is how does the injector know um, how to create a car when we ask for a car? 
And uh, if the car has dependencies, how does the injector know which dependencies actually to resolve? Of course, we're passing in all the dependencies in our factory function right here that we need in our entire application, but it doesn't tell the, the uh, injector um, which dependencies are needed for this particular car service. So if we take a look at our car class, it's exactly the same code. We again need something like annotation. Our class needs to know what dependencies are needed in order to create an object of it. And this is where this comes in. So what we do here, we again, we inject something from the uh, DI system. It's called inject. And then we extend the cons uh, constructor with those weird guys here. And you might wonder, what the hell is that? So basically what happens here is, it's some metadata information that tells the injector that the first parameter of that constructor is an instance of the type engine. And the second one is tires, and the third one is doors. And the type here is actually also a token at the same time. But how is it possible that we can use inject with this at sign? So what you see here is um, something that is called decorators. And decorators is a proposal for ES7, so it's really like something that eventually uh, will be standardized. And um, decorators allow us to, like the name says, um, to, to decorate existing objects with additional information. And um, the reason that we are able to, to write the code like this and make it run is only because we, we can use trans transpilers today, right? So there are two transpilers that actually um, support decorators, and those are Babel and um, TypeScript. So and a decorator in the end is just a function, right? The, the at sign that we use is just uh, part of the syntax, but in the end, the decorator itself is just a, uh, just a function. So what we see here is a very, very simplified implementation of what the inject decorator does. It takes some dependencies, and it has access to the target, which in our case is the car class. And then it adds some parameters on that class. That's all it does. So basically what happens is we call inject with engine on the car instance, or on the car class. So what that means is, if we take a look at that code, and we transpile that to ES5, what we get is something like that. Right? A, a class in ES6, in the end, is just a function in ES5. And parameters is just a property on that particular function. And then we have an array of parameters. And you see that each parameter currently is also an array itself. That's just because if you have more than one annotation or decorate, uh, decorator for a single parameter, those are listed up in, in, in each array. So in the end, what this decorator does, it really just adds metadata to that particular class. And the injection system is able to read out that data in order to find out which other dependencies need to be instantiated in order to create a car object. Does that make sense? OK, everybody goes like, like this, so we can move on. So but let's get back to the bindings. What is happening here? So we just pass in a list of classes, and those are supposed to be bindings. So it turns out that those classes here, as we write them there, is actually it's part of a kind of shorthand syntax. It's like an implicit syntax of defining bindings. We can write the explicit version of it, and it would, be, it would look something like this. So we import a function bind from the DI system, and, and then this is what happens. We say, OK, we create an injector with the following bindings. We bind the token car to the class car, and we do the same for the, for the engine, for the tires, and for the doors. So basically what we're seeing here what we're passing to bind is a token, and a token can be a type, which in the end is a class, or a string. And we bind it to another class. And the classes are here. So you might wonder, why, why do we want to do that? Actually, this is something you probably won't do, because you can just use the, use the, the shorthand syntax. But what this allows us to do is something like this. Bind engine to class other engine, boom. So, I show once again. We bind the token engine to another class, other engine. What does that mean? 
So it enables us basically to do three things. First, we, uh, we are able to map a token that is used across our application to any class, doesn't matter. So if you, have a, if you have an application with 10 classes and they all ask for something like engine, they will get an instance of other engine. If you want to swap out that dependency, you can just do it there. You just bind it to another class. And there are no name conflicts anymore because other engine in that case is also just a type or a class or maybe just another variable that, is, uh, that has the value of another class. So if you're using, um, or, yeah, if you're using a dependency, that is called engine, and you have a third-party uh, library or extension that also introduces a service engine, then this is the way how you can actually map both, um, uh, both dependencies into your application without any name collision. Right, <clears throat> and um, this is actually not all. We can, we can do more, so there are more binding instructions. Next to to class, we also have something like uh, to value, which actually lets us bind a token to some value. So what happens here is we bind string to the, to the string hello world. So if you have a class that has a dependency of type string, what you get is hello world as a string, which is amazing because uh, you can do something like configuration, uh, configurations with that that are injectable. We have uh, to alias which basically maps a token to yet another token, right? So if you have an engine and you would rather name it V8 for whatever reason, you can create an alias for that particular token that binds to a class engine, which is super powerful. And of course, we have factories. So in some cases, you might need something like that, where you have a function that actually finds out which dependency you're actually, uh, you actually want to instantiate. So whenever somebody asks for um, an object that is of type engine, what you get back is either a V8 engine or v V6 engine, depending on what the condition uh, evaluates to. And of course, the factory itself can, ha can have their own dependencies, which is, um, so, so you're, you can introduce them just with a second parameter here. It's just a list of another, another list of tokens that your injectors already configured, and then you can use those in your factory. And I think this is actually pretty, pretty cool because it's like super powerful. It basically solves all our problems that we have with the DI system in Angular 1 right now. Mm. So there's still one thing that we haven't talked about yet, which is asynchronicity. So what are we doing with that? It turns out that the new DI system introduces yet another binding instruction, which is called toAsyncFactory. And what toAsyncFactory allows us to do is basically um, we can create a promise, and the promise will eventually resolve or reject depending on whatever happens inside that uh, code. And then it will return that promise, and whenever we ask for something like engine in that case, we get an engine promise, which eventually will be resolved. So here, we return a promise, we fetch some engine data, and when the data comes back, we actually create a new instance of engine with that data, right? But still, in your in your uh, application code, you just ask for something of type engine. This leads to more um, decorators, because all of a sudden, we have two strategies. We can inject um, dependencies synchronous, uh, synchronous or asynchronous, which means we need a new decorator that tells our application or our injector that some parameters are actually injected asynchronously. So what we can do is we use inject promise as a decorator. So what it does is it basically um, tests the, the, the injector, okay, so this is the token engine, and, um, and the in uh, injection system then finds out, okay, so it's, it's the, the token that is bound to the async factory, so it returns a promise. So what we get is an engine promise. And then later um, in our constructor, we can use that promise in order to um, react on some some stuff, depending on what the, what the promise does. There's another thing called inject lazy, and inject lazy basically gives you the factory function that um, the ejector itself uses in order to create um, a dependency. So in this case, you can create an engine only if you really need it. And we also have um, optional dependencies. 
So a decorator optional. And this is, uh, by the way, the first time you see more than one decorator on one parameter. And um, so what happens here is we're injecting an engine which is optional, and if there's no engine in the system, then it will return now. It can be uh, very helpful if you have something like um, that your, let's say your, your, your class expects something like jQuery or something, and it's just optional, then it allows you to um, create a fallback or ask for a fallback. So the following problems are now solved in this DI system, which are, so we have uh, asynchronous and synchronous uh, strategies. We have no namespace um, conflicts anymore through the, because of the, the binding instructions. It can be used standalone. Whatever you see right here is a framework agnostic system, right? I actually saw people using that with React, which I think is awesome. But there's still one thing. Dependencies are served as singletons. So it turns out that the new DI system still returns singletons. So how do we handle that? There's a concept that is called transient dependencies. And what that means is we can, we can create child injectors in our application in order to override some bindings or in order to get different uh, instances of a um, specific class. So what does it look like? Here we have the same code. We create an injector with a binding engine, which is, as we know, uh, bind engine to class engine. And we create a child injector that gets the same binding but if we ask both, both injectors for that um, type, we get different instances, right? So this is one thing. The other thing is that if we, like when we create a child injector and we have a parent injector that uh, has more than just an engine binding and we ask the child injector for a binding that is actually not configured in the ch child injector, then those bindings are logged up in the, in the parent injector. It sounds super confusing. Um, that's why I have this awesome uh, graphic here that I, by the way, stole from, from Merrick. So we create a parent injector with three bindings, uh, with four bindings, car, engine, and tires, and doors. And we create a child injector with car and engine, and we create another child injector with just car. So what happens if we now ask the second child injector um, for a service car? What we get is the car object created by the child child injector, but there's no engine binding configured in that child injector, so it looks it up in the parent injector, and so on and so forth. So it's a kind of prototypical inheritance what's happening here. You're not impressed. <laughs> so when I saw that the first time, I was like, like wow, that's awesome um, and super flexible and everything. But yeah, so how is it used in Angular 2 then? So, I don't know if you've seen any Angular 2 code yet. You probably did. This is what a component in Angular 2 looks like. So, we have a class. In this case, just has a constructor that sets a name property, nothing, nothing special here. And then we have two more decorators, also known as annotations. Um, and the component decorator basically tells Angular, hey, this particular class is a component. And the view annotation tells Angular, this view configuration is the view for this component. Nothing super special about it. And then we just need to bootstrap that application. Bootstrap is a function that we also need to import from the Angular source code, from, from the framework. So this is how you create your first Angular 2 application. Super simple. So what happens if we want to inject a service? So we create a service named service. It does nothing special. It sets a name property, and it has a method to get the name. And what we do then is we pass that service to that bootstrap function. And this is basically the resolve and create part, right? So you pass in a binding. What you're allowed to do is you can also use the bind syntax here. So it's, again, just the shorthand syntax in order to make the name service available across your entire application. And then in your component, what you need to do is you just inject that name service of the type name service and get an instance of that. If you're into TypeScript, you can just use TypeScript like that. So you add type annotations, and it works the same way. What is interesting here is you don't have any decorator machinery here anymore, right? So this is just plain TypeScript code, and it works out of the box. There's another thing. Um, you might want to use child injectors in order to uh, 
create a different binding for a name service in a particular component, and this is where the injectables property of the component comes in. So if you've seen that, what it basically does is it uh, just configures new bindings for that particular component. It's basically a child injector that is created at that point. Okay, so, so we learned that the DI system, the new DI system in Angular 2, solves all the problem of, of uh, Angular 1. And uh, it's super flexible. It is synchronous and asynchronous, and you can use it with your code because it's framework agnostic, which is awesome. And uh, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Well, there are a lot of questions, so we're going to be sitting here for a while. No coffee for you. Uh oh. Uh oh. Please, please ask questions that I can actually answer. Thank you. <laughs> They're only hard questions. I don't know how we are going to manage. Okay, so the first one is can you explain the difference between the dependency injection pattern and the factory pattern? The dependency injection pattern and the factory pattern? Um, in Angular 1, or is it a question from Twitter? Yes. Okay, then it's it probably is. a bit hard to ask. So. The factory pattern as a design pattern itself, it's, it's just a pattern that creates an instance of an object, um, but it has nothing to do with, with uh, dependency injection per se. It's just a way of creating objects. So what you can do is, instead of um, doing something like var car equals new car, so you're asking the, you're calling the constructor directly, what you can do is you can have a car factory that gives you a car. Um, so you basically abstract the concrete implementation away, which is good, but it has nothing to do with dependency injection. So it's not really a, a versus R question, I guess. So the next one is pretty great. Um, if you should convince people about static typing in JavaScript, what would you say? <laughs> you can do it in dramatic voice. So I like TypeScript, that's my answer. Fair enough, I think that's acceptable. Um, can you explain the benefits of the DI framework over a more traditional AMD loading approach? Okay, so that's a good question. Um, I, think, I think we need to distinguish here. Um, AMD is a module system that allows you to, to load modules in, in ES5 today, right? You can do it with, with CommonJS or SystemJS or, or AMD or whatever you wanna do. Um, dependency injection is on a, on a different layer. It, it doesn't um, solve the problem of loading modules, right? So what you've seen in the code was um, we, we used ES6 and ES6 modules, um, but the dependency injection basically has nothing to do with it. So there are two different things, loading modules and, and dependency injection. Okay, two more, which are kind of connected. How async dependency injection works after minification and will async dependencies allow generators as well? That's a good question. So good the, the minification actually is decoupled from whatever binding instruction you use. So the nice thing that we have with the new dependency injection system is we, we can use string tokens, but we don't have to. So if you just do something like bind car to class car, there's no string and minification just works, right? And you, you cannot minify strings, so that's actually better. Um, I'm actually not sure how the generator support will be in the asynchronous dependency Wow, injection. there are just so many questions. I think we're going to sit here forever, seriously. <laughs> well, we have a couple more minutes, so might as well. Oh, wow. um, can we inject objects into functions instead of class constructors? Oh, good question. Um, Again, a class is just a function. So if you transpile a class in ES6 to ES5, it will be just a constructor function. So the answer is yes. In the end, you can use that system in ES5 and just write functions. It's the same, the same stuff. It's just that, um, that one slide where we saw what the decorator does to that class when we transpile it. So the answer is yes. For the rest of the conference, we're just going to have this interview, basically. Just bring food, okay, and coffee, thank you. <laughs> um, okay, two more, because I guess they will be quick. Is there a way to destroy cleanup injectors? To what, sorry? To, um, is there a way to destroy slash cleanup injectors? Ah, okay, um, no. I mean, it's just an object. 
So same rules apply to the injector as to every object in JavaScript. Okay, last question. Um, how can we handle code modification? Do we have do we have an inject variable in Angular 2 as well? Right, so I think that question I already answered yeah. with the other answer. That's what I thought. Just right, so sure. minification just works. It's just code. Um, if you don't use strings, then it's even better, and you can use that, do that with a new dependency injection system. So, yeah. Uh, okay, maybe one question from the audience, if there is one. Or everyone was using Twitter. Uh, I, have a, I have a question, actually. To yourself? Okay. Uh, no, to good. you guys. Um, <laughs> Are you actually excited about that stuff? I was super <laughs> excited when I learned about it, but you were like, oh, wow. Well. <laughs> yeah. Hello. In the return in about... Uh, Where? Ah, over there. Here. Hi there. Here. Uh, in the return in, in about asynchronous AMD, common JS, uh, they are solved the same problem as the dependency. Uh, also, and the uh, models loading, loading the models. Why we should use something else if we have common JS that solves the same problem? So um, I think it's it's not really this exactly the same problem. Like when you use something like AMD or common JS, it's still just a way to load a module or to load a dependency. But you still, at some point, have a sort of main function that you need to maintain in order to create objects. It, of course, it depends on your, on your code and on your use case. But um, as I said, so, so you have module loading, which is one thing, and you have dependency injection, which is, which is really just a way of creating objects and, and passing them into constructors, uh, which you maybe want to abstract away, which you can do with that system. So I, I think those are two different things. Okay. That's my opinion, at least. Okay. Okay, since we could actually sit here forever from what I'm saying, like hand-wise and Twitter-wise, and I think everyone wants coffee, and also we have a, another talk upcoming after the break. Uh, we're going to break it off, but worry not, Pascal's still here. You can catch him and ask all the questions. He might get or not get annoyed. Uh, <laughs> I also I have stickers, by the way, if you're yeah. interested in stickers. Uh, so if you have any more questions for Pascal, as I'm sure you do, just catch him during the break or during lunch, but let the guy eat first, please. Uh, thank you so much. That was amazing. Thank you very much.